Okay, we're on Try and Google Plus um, Hangouts today, and I'm with Natalie Sisson, who is from uh, Natalie is from New Zealand, but could be anywhere in the world at any given time. Uh, where are you at the moment, Natalie? <laughs> I'm in I'm in Amsterdam, Netherlands. In the Netherlands, very nice. What's the yeah. What sort of weather that they have there at the moment? It's looking out the window. It's actually sunny today, but it's getting really, really cold. And because I usually travel in my suitcase with light stuff, I don't actually have enough warm clothes. So I have to go out and fortunately do something I'm not so cool with, which is a bit of a shop. So do you just for a while stock up? You, uh, you only have one suitcase? I do only have one suitcase. I lie at this moment in time, I have one and a half, which stresses me out a little bit just because I had to get a bit of extra gear after the Africa bike ride. But yeah, pretty much can fit into one suitcase. Hence your title, The Suitcase Entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. which I love exactly. that title. I love that title. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to talk a little bit about it, but tell us um, what were you doing 10 years ago and what's the sort of the back of the envelope, uh, Natalie Sisson story, suitcase entrepreneur, that side of things. God, 10 years ago. Jesus, that was quite a while, wasn't it? So I actually have 10 years experience, no, actually about eight years experience in the corporate world. And, uh, and I think it really helped shape a lot of my reasons for going into business myself now. But I formerly come from like a marketing, brand management, product management, event management, business development background. And I'm probably a little like many entrepreneurs until I knew what I really wanted to do. I swapped jobs so much. Like I'd go in, gung-ho, do my job as best I could, get rave reviews, and then I'd be like, oh, I'm bored, I want to go and do a little bit of travel. So I, I did that on and off for about eight years. Held some really great positions, both in New Zealand, also in London, and um, just got to travel a lot through my work as well. But yeah, back in the days, it was kind of all sorts of different industries, but mainly in the marketing, brand management, and business development roles. So you, you did have a startup at one point? Yes, fun, and then fun, in fun, uh, 2008, yeah, I went to Canada, Vancouver, and I was like determined to start my own business. And instead, I met my business partner at a networking event over a giant cheese board, actually, which is obviously where all business should be conducted. And uh, he had an idea for a startup, which was in the social media payments sort of, I guess, space, which was really interesting at the time because people were still wary of Facebook, and also payments in Facebook was even more confusing for them. So it was a really um, fascinating industry to be in and a tough, tough startup to get into, but I absolutely loved it. Worked my ass off for around a year and a half, giving your life and soul to that, to that company, learning all about investing, pitching investors, business models, application development, customer, kind of customer testing and service. It was um, a fantastic foundation for them starting my own business. Fantastic. Well, let's get into the own business because you are the suitcase entrepreneur. Um, <laughs> your tagline, creating freedom in business and adventure in life. Is that it? Yeah. How, nice important, how important is it to have a statement or a tagline, do you think, in this space? Uh, hugely important, I personally think. Actually, more for me than my customers or community because every time that I say, I'm creating freedom of business and venture in life. I had to double check in on myself and go, well, am I? Like, am I living and breathing the values that are really important to me? And I think I personally do. But I also think there's a lot of people who have these crazy cool taglines, but they don't really stand behind them. So for me, I think it helps define your business. And it also gives people, the shorter the tagline and the more emphasis it has on it, the better it is for people when they first come to your site or when they first meet you to go, okay, that's what you do. I get it. And then they can choose to you know, be more interested in you or not, but at least they have that summary line of exactly kind of what you do and why that matters to them. Do you find you start talking about yourself in the third person, being the suitcase entrepreneur? Um, <laughs> I don't know, actually. No, I don't think so. I think I usually talk about what's happening right now. I'm very much like gung-ho, this is it, this is what we're doing. Um, no, I usually talk about what I'm doing right now, but how that applies to other people because that's probably the biggest lesson I've learned in the last year is it's it's nothing to do with me. It's not it's really not about me at all. It's about people who can see a little bit of themselves and what I'm doing and then realize that it's possible that they can do it as well. So that's when it becomes I think really interesting. So when when you're confused you don't ask what would the suitcase entrepreneur do? What 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 would one do? Well basically um, sorry, what do I do as a suitcase entrepreneur? 
No, no, I'm just saying as, um, um, you know, like what would a, if you had an alter ego, I suppose, then you have to say what would the suitcase entrepreneur do? Oh, or I say, see what you mean, yeah. in this regard. I mean, I guess mine is <laughs> the PR warrior and my tagline is PR warrior on the front line of the communications revolution. So I can sort of slip into another alter ego occasionally. Yeah, no, I do. I sometimes do do that. For sure, I like to stand by my suitcase, hold it up, think I'm really cool. Take on <laughs> and trains and buses in one single leap. Now, you've got a, a, a growing platform, so you have the blog, but you don't necessarily mm -hmm. think of yourself as just a blogger. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll probably go into that in a minute because there is a sub genre of blog that you're in, which is a travel blogger, but you don't see yourself necessarily as that. But you've got Twitter and you've got Facebook and LinkedIn too. Um, how do they all work? Because on Twitter, you've got good followings on uh, your personal one, so that's your name, and then you've got an even better following on um, suitcase preneur, isn't it? It's preneur mm -hmm. because you because of the, um, the limitation. Too long. <laughs> um, how, do you, how do you manage those two? And do you double up or are they, you know, different things? Ooh, lots of questions. So first off, I actually, like, coach social media. It's one of my passions. It's how I got going. Like, I wouldn't be around if it hadn't been for social media. So I'm on almost every platform that you can think of, but I guess what I do preach to people is that you only really want to be on the platforms where your audience are. So, you know, I personally adore Twitter. It sends most traffic to my site, followed by my Facebook page and personal profile. Um, LinkedIn is fantastic for, you know, contacts and networks and groups, but I've tended to come away from it a little bit more. Um, I feel the platform itself is just getting a little bit too, it's just too much. It's like they're trying to lock everything away behind paid doors, and I feel it's too much to keep up with. So for me, Facebook and Twitter is definitely where my audience is. I also love Pinterest and been getting more into Google+, Plus um, because predominantly that's where my community is, so it makes sense. In terms of my two Twitter accounts, yeah, I actually started out with at Natalie Sisson because it was available, which is great. You should always grab your name and your, I guess what I like to call kind of your space online, your identity. Even if you're not going to use it, you should, you should park it. You probably mm -hmm. agree. Um, because you don't want other Natalie Sissons out there saying stupid things and people are like, what are you saying? I'm like, it's not me. So um, Natalie Sisson and I started out with, and it was very much just personal comments around travel, around business, around Ultimate Frisbee, which is one of my passions. And then I realized that if I'm going to be talking business all the time, particularly women, I should have a separate handle for that, I thought, because it could be much more focused. Um, at the time, it was at Woman's World, because that was what my blog was called. And then I got to luckily change over, thank God, um, that Twitter allows you to do that to the suitcase preneur, because as yeah. you know, suitcase entrepreneur is too long. Um, and it was a really easy transition. So how I manage them is through Hootsuite, my favorite social media dashboard. It allows me to post to either one account or both accounts. I tend to try and keep separate um, tweets, but it is quite handy to have two accounts. I know some people are like, you should only ever have one. I don't find it's an extra um, hassle for me to post to both. And also, the Natalie Sisson one is more personal, so I can talk about a range of things, whereas Suitcase Preneur is much more focused on business, travel, adventure. Um, and also sometimes where I promote more of my products or other people's products are recommended. So I think it's, it's pretty easy to manage, actually, through Hootsuite. Yep. So uh, Hootsuite, I like TweakDeck. Um, haven't never got okay. into Hootsuite. And, uh, Never got into <laughs> I mean, try and use Buffer app occasionally as well, which I kind of mm -hmm. like that um, in terms of putting links out there. Because if you mm -hmm. if you batch read like I do and you're chucking them out, it's um, you can annoy a few people if you don't spread them out. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of let's go back into the blogging thing because um, the suitcase entrepreneur is uh, your main blog, um, mm -hmm. and it's you know if it's it's quite an easy thing to because you do travel a lot, um, to drop you into the travel uh, blogger scene, which is a sub-genre of the whole global blogging community, isn't there? I mean, there's a lot of people, you guys know each other and everything. So how does that how does that work? Is there a, you know, is it, do you need a secret password or what is it? What, you know, like it just... I, I have so to say, honestly, I honestly do not see myself as a travel blogger. I'm a business blogger through and through. So I am basically helping people to create your ideal lifestyle design and business. So I whether, whether you travel or not, my blog is around 
business, launching products, social media, all those things that help you to do that. Productivity, um, yeah, just being able to move with online tools and social media and business. But having said that, when we just discussed before we started this call, obviously people are interested in that. How are you always traveling and living out of your suitcase and running your business from anywhere? So that's why I am starting a video series actually of this week that's going to be kind of like on location based some travel tips and then into what that means in relation to building your business. So that'll be that's going to be my test of kind of doing that. But I, I do not actually write about any of the countries that I ever go to, ever. Um, and I think in some ways that's kind of sad because I know people are always really interested, right? So it's blending and merging that to make it more relevant. As it's on your personal travel, page. It's on your personal page. That, yeah? uh, on your personal page you talk about travel? Um, on my personal profile page on Facebook I do, yeah. I'll, I'll put up photos. Like I'll put up photos from where I'm at, but I don't ever talk about it then on the blog. On my personal yeah. blog, Natalie Sis and I do very little blogging on there anymore, yeah. but I used to. That used to be my it friends and family yeah. here I am. That was a bit older. Um, but one blog is enough for me right now. Yeah. Uh, however, um, yeah, the travel blogging scene is quite interesting, and I think you're right. It is a bit of a clique. Um, it is very competitive. It's a very crowded space, and I think it's hard to stand out in there. And that's why I, I never even considered myself a travel blogger. But I do, um, yeah, I think there's really friendly people who do it and are all trying to vie for that special angle. So what's that special source that they have? And I, I, some of them have done a really, really good job of it. I think it's all about having a unique voice and providing great information that's kind of relevant but in an educational and entertainment-based way. Otherwise, anybody can write about, you know, oh, and today I went and visited this, this, and this. Like, you can get that information from anywhere. It's what's the nuggets of insight that people who aren't there on the ground with you wouldn't know unless you could describe it to them really well. And I so, personally think videos are the, the best thing when it comes to that. So your, um, your suitcase could be anywhere. It's just that flexibility of mm -hmm. doing it wherever, whenever, however you want. Yeah. Yeah, yep. exactly. Yeah. And I'm not proposing that people go and live out of suitcases because it's very much a certain oh. lifestyle. And I, some people actually this year for the first time have said, I don't know how you do it. I'd never want to do that. And I'm like, what? It's the best life in the world. But no, I realize that some people just aren't interested in that. But more it's about the opportunity to be flexible and to pack up your business and make it more portable and mobile so you can work from home, from cafes, from trains and planes if you had to. That's, that's, that's the key. That's the key. Um, yes. Now, in terms of you've you do coaching, so let's look at the you're you're a uh, multiple uh, multiple <laughs> income stream. So you're a coach. You've got yep. a mastermind group. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got a number of products. Can you work us walk us through your products and um, and what yeah. what sort of works for you the most at the moment? Are you you know you've got other paths? You've got the video series. Of it. Is that a is that a paid or a free thing? How, how do you work? Well, somebody can pay me to do it, but no, it's going to be free. I, I would say 90% of what I do, probably like you, is free. It's all about providing a ton of value and insight to people. Um, and then people will step up and know that you do all that value and want to pay you for the other things. So my business design coaching is one-on-one. -on -one. It's always done on Skype. And I love doing that. It's a good percentage of my income. Um, it's obviously very time intensive and one on one, so it's not particularly scalable. But for me personally, I think it really helps my skills in offering business advice specific to my clients. And generally, those people are either just starting out online or they have a bricks and mortar business and they're wanting to transfer it over to the online world and understand social media, online tools, systems, how they can promote themselves, how they can brand themselves, um, how they even just set anything up like autoresponders and all those wonderful things, which I love. Uh, and then We Mastermind is something that I do in collaboration with another Natalie called Natalie McNeil. And that's just because we're super passionate about getting more women into business. So it's a, a six-month program that gets you from zero to launch of a product or service with a huge mastermind component and uh, twice-monthly coaching calls. Okay. And that's a really lucrative product. We do it only once a year. It's um, it's something that we absolutely love and we see great results in, but it's like a once a year thing with a big launch and a big amount of revenue that comes in from that. And obviously we put a lot into it. And then I have just um, some digital products in my store which are specifically focused on, one is building your online business. It's a it's an ebook. Um, it's an audio book and it's probably my most popular product. It's basically how I built my business but applying it to you and it's 
really fun and easy and strategic and actionable. Um, and I have an ultimate entrepreneur's toolkit because I absolutely love using tools and that is just going through the top 85 tools that I think you could use both free and paid to run your business. 85. Um, 85. 85. Yeah, but they're free and paid. So it's like if you want to run a webinar, here's a free version, here's a paid version. I don't use 85 tools in my oh. business. <laughs> I probably use around 18 to 20 absolutely regularly on any given week and I keep paring that down more and more but the point is it is all about trial and error like you've got to find the systems that work for you so I wanted to give people choice but not too much choice you know when people go here's a thousand things you can do I'm like I don't want a thousand things I want one thing that I can do right now what are your um, three favorite tools my three favorite tools are Dropbox it's absolutely amazing it's my online storage cloud solution I put everything on there my podcasts, my client files, my videos, um, my images, my photos. Um, I absolutely love something called Boomerang, which you'd appreciate as an Australian. It's a Gmail extension, um, really, really small monthly fee, and essentially allows me to manage my inbox so much better. I can boomerang an email to come back at a more appropriate time. I can send an email later so it doesn't look like I'm always online, which I'm not. Um, it's just a really handy tool that organizes my inbox for me, and I realize how much I, how much I use it. And, oh my God, well, I actually just have to say, I really love Google Drive, you know, the old Google Docs. I do almost everything in terms of sharing folders, files, um, editing documents online, live while I'm there, doing PowerPoints, um, Excel spreadsheets, Word documents, guest posts, pretty much live and breathe and just have all my folders organized on Google Drive. And so it's free and I just think it's one of the most amazing tools. It's fantastic. It's great, you know, that just to know that it's always there and it's always saving mm -hmm. and always backing up and um, just uh, imagine if you didn't have that. I mean, it'd just yeah. be nice. A nightmare to have to always find a place of, to putting all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing is then you've got to keep all of those folders just like the, it, it doesn't matter whether it's physical filing cabinet or in the cloud, um, still yeah. got to keep folders neat and tidy and uh, yeah, that was my, that's always my issue. Um, let's switch gears for a minute to uh, media coverage. You've had a lot of coverage over, over the journey. You've been um, doing this for a few years now and your profiles mm -hmm. Being right is rising all the time, and your brand. Um, how oh, much? Good. <laughs> you've been in Huffington Post and on Mashable and Forbes and things like that. Yep. How much do they come to you, and how much do you go to them? Are you That's proactively seeking media, or you're, um, you're being asked to submit things? I actually didn't proactively seek media in the beginning and so Forbes was just one of those crazy random things where, and I'll tell you exactly how it happened, I think it was December 2009 and I'd seen a blog post on Forbes that said, tell us how you're going to have a stress-free holiday and what your tips are, write about it. And uh, so I wrote about it on my blog and they picked it up and linked to it in a Forbes article. And I was like, holy shit, I'm on Forbes. Um, and I still don't to this day know why. I guess maybe I answered their question relatedly exactly. And then the next week, I'm not kidding, the next, no, it was a couple of months later, sorry, I got this email mailbox saying, Forbes calling, would you like to write for us? And I was like, let me think about that. Um, okay. So, yeah, it was really fortuitous. I still just think it was just a massive opportunity being online, talking about the right things. Um, and specifically with a woman-based focus, and it was Forbes women who approached me. And then uh, earlier this year, actually, they just made me a contributor so I can publish what I want when I want. The interesting thing, though, I think people need to know about that is, um, you know, people think, ooh, Forbes, it's really impressive. And it is. It gives you credibility, I guess. But in terms of the actual traffic and readership, that side is huge. And for example, I posted a blog post yesterday. I don't use it enough as a platform. But whilst posting that blog platform, there were 33 more blog posts that went live in that hour. So it just gives you an indication of how much content is going through Forbes. And, Whoa. you know, you're just like this tiny little blip in the sphere. Even though you're writing for Forbes, it's not necessarily sending a ton of traffic to my site. Uh, it does send traffic and it is great for visibility. But I think people need to keep that in mind because some of my most successful ways of being found online, reaching out to people has been through guest posting on smaller niche sites where my community actually is. And they've been far more preferable in terms of sending traffic back to me, more sign-ups to my newsletter, 
and actually, you know, allowing me to make more sales and, and build this cool community. So I think it's great to have the Mashables and the Huffington Post. And some of that was through syndications or associations that I was with, for example, um, young entrepreneurs. And, you know, they do a good job of getting the media out there. But the rest of it has just come through sometimes reaching out for guest posts um, and quite strategically and other times being found by other people through connections and then they've come to interview me or ask if I'll do something. So you so kind of, it, it, it does post. start to roll there. So you could recommend the guest post as a, as a strategy to st start raising your profile as long as it's, it's, it is strategic where it is that, you know. I absolutely, 100%. I just wrote a blog post on why it's so powerful yesterday and why it can exponentially grow your blog traffic. And, the, and here's my analogy for it. If you go to, I think this is what people do, they write great blog posts on their blog and then they sit back and go, come and read it, and nobody does, right? Because they're not out there with anybody else. You can share it on your own social media, you can share it within your own small community, but you can't grow a community from within your community, yeah. really, unless people are absolutely wildly recommending it. So I kind of think it is you have to go down the road to the local bar, you have to have chats and conversations with people, and then take them back to your bar for a drink. <laughs> that's how it works. And that's what guest posting is. You go out, you write amazing copy for these people, something that really, really resonates. You draw them back to your amazing copy on your site, and that's how it starts to proliferate. So guest posting, 100%, but being strategic about it, for sure. Otherwise, you could do a lot of writing for a lot of places and not much out of it. And as you say, yeah. you've the content that you put on other people's blogs almost probably has to be better than the stuff you put on your own potentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I yeah, I agree. Um, now I listen to your podcast very regularly, um, and you keep oh, it up. Really? Yeah, I do, I do. I, I love oh. podcasts. I'm, uh, I just love podcasts. I, um, I probably even would w listen to podcasts more than I watch video. It's not that I don't like video. It's just that it, it's good use of my time when I'm out or walking or on a tram or a bus or um, that sort of stuff. Um, but how have you found that? Why did you do a podcast? Um, you're getting up to how many episodes now? About 30 something? Does that ring a bell? Actually, um, God, I, yeah, it might even be more. Sorry, I should know, shouldn't I? Because I only do it every two weeks. Um, do you yeah, keep that, do you keep that schedule with like, Because I think with podcasts, you dip in and out. Um, you know, it's regularity is the, is the number one key for it. Um, I'm very regular once every <laughs> six weeks. Um, but <laughs> how have you found that? Because, I, you know, you talk to guys like uh, Pat Flynn from um, Smart Passive Income and, and uh, guys like that, and they've, I see Derek Halpern's also gone on to blogging, um, on to podcasting as well. And there's quite a few established bloggers who are, who are, really getting into the podcasting side of things and uh, the word is that it brings them a whole new traffic because, of, you know, you're on iTunes. Uh, mm. Have you found, um, you know, that podcasting has increased your traffic or any sort of anecdotes of, of um, sort of the traffic? Yeah, I, I actually directly haven't checked my stats on that, but I think what it has done is once again it's added another layer of credibility and it's reached out to an audience that I couldn't have got in front of before. So, you know, iTunes is absolutely huge. One, it's huge to get found in there, but two, yeah. there's just a massive audience there. And my downloads have really started going up a lot more, and especially in the last three or four months. Um, as my, I think, my interviews have become better and the quality of the people that I've got on the show have become better. It's always, um, I won't say it's hit and miss, but you never know until you talk to somebody how the interview's going to go. And I just yeah. interviewed Derek Halpern, like he's my latest one this week, and his oh, energy is off the Richter scale, right? So we had a lot yeah. of fun and got through a ton of content because he's just a stellar guy. Whereas then I've done some other interviews since then and they're a little more, what I would say, low-key, like the people are just less supercharged than somebody like Derek. And I think they all work. Um, um, but, yeah, you do have to manage that, I guess. You become better as an interviewer. Quality of it becomes better. Maybe the questions become better. You start to, um, you know, know who you want to talk to a little bit more. And so directly related to the question, yes, I think it's driven quite a lot more traffic back to me but also brought in an audience, as I said, that wouldn't have even maybe been on the blog at all or isn't in the blogosphere, but they like podcasts. Um, and for me personally, I think it's a great thing, as you probably do too, you just learn a lot, right? So you get you learn a lot about yourself, you ask questions that you want answered and also maybe that you think your community wants answered. Yeah. It's a little bit like jumping on with a mentor or an advisor or somebody every two weeks and, and getting 
you know, some great feedback from them on, and things on how they built their business and how they yeah. built their lifestyle. So I think it really works to keep you on your toes and keep it fresh. And uh, it's wonderful because it also helps you with connections. So every single person I contact, I'm having a half an hour phone call with or Skype call. And then you've got this kind of instant rapport there as well. Yeah, I, I, I'm a massive fan of it. And there's, a, there's a, I've been reading a couple of articles of late where they're saying, you know, podcasting is about to undergo a renaissance. Um, and I like that. And uh, but, but the whole theory is, you know, it's now there's now the app on um, that comes with the iPhone and, and, and just some bigger players are getting into the space and, you know, the technology is getting a little bit better and, you know, just some things that are underbubbling along the way because it's kind of podcasting is a bit more of the unsung hero and there's videos kind of just taken off crazily and um, and I just you know and if you do video interviews or Skype interviews you can um, you know you can still strip out the audio and have a podcast because people want options not everyone's going to watch video yeah exactly yeah I think Tyrone Shum does a good job of that your fellow Australian like he does the podcast interview to a YouTube video but then he also has the podcast mp3 to download and uh, yeah. I do people both options yeah, and then some people want to write it, uh, read it, so you have to give them the written version. But it's, it's repurposing your content, isn't it? Yeah. Um, now, tell me, you've got multiple interests, um, as you've already alluded to, but you've you've done some modelling and TV presenting and motocross <laughs> racing and tennis and triathlons, <laughs> bodybuilding. Bodybuilding is still body sculpting. Body sculpting. I wasn't one body of those like, Sorry, there are yes. people. There is yeah. a difference. And uh, dragon boat racing uh, with a bit of brush with uh, British royalty fame there. So what yeah. can you tell us about the dragon boat racing? Oh, my goodness. That was such a great opportunity. I was working for um, Bausch & Lom in London at the time, and we went across to Norway for one of those management meetings. It was brilliant. And the key speaker on stage was a lady called Deborah Searle who had actually rode single-handedly across the Atlantic when her <laughs> she set up this amazing journey. And her partner at the time decided he was claustrophobic. You can actually get claustrophobic on the ocean, would you believe? So the long and short of it is he, he jumped out of the boat and she had to finish the thing by herself and it took her three months instead of a month. And she actually wasn't uh, qualified because the guy had got out of the boat. It ruined her. It doesn't matter. The point is she's an amazing lady and she was um, obviously a huge rower and going fan and she said Natalie because I was so enthusiastic talking to her about sports and everything she said you should come and try out for the sisterhood um, which was a bunch of around 20 ladies mainly from England but a few internationals there was one Australian one South African myself um, and basically we were attempting to dragon boat across the English Channel so for people who don't know what dragon boating is predominantly it's a thousand meter sprint race in um, a Chinese style boat where you have paddles and you're just doing a really short movement um, and it's supposed to be a speed race, like <laughs> go, go, go. But we were doing it for like ridiculous journey across the English Channel. So we trained um, two mornings a week at like 6 a.m. on the Thames. It was a really beautiful time. Like it was hard work, but the women were amazing. They were all very different in their own right. Some of them were a little bit more upper crust English. And as we were nearing to the time of when we were going to cross the Channel, which was in August 2007, um, we got Kate Middleton, who was a friend of a friend, um, had been to school with some of the girls. She came along and joined us for some training. And it was a really strategic move because it helped her to build her platform and her brand because up until then she'd really been known as, you know, William's girlfriend and also working at Burberry. And so she didn't really have much else outside of, you know, who is Kate, what's her, what's her brand, what else does she do aside from being Prince's girlfriend. And for us, it was huge for publicity, and we managed to get Hello on board as a sponsor for like 100,000 pounds. So it worked out really well. And in addition to that, she only came along like maybe four or five times. Really lovely lady, really beautiful in person as well. But it was quite bizarre being out in the water every morning because we all look like shit, to be honest. Sorry if I can swear on this. And, you know, it's 6 a.m. in the morning. You don't put makeup on. You go out, you're splashing around in the Thames. You're working hard. You're sweating. And she was like at the helm because that was easier for her to come in. She hadn't developed the strength in her arms by then. So she's standing up there looking all pretty, <laughs> steering our boat. And, um, and we're, you know, paddling along and we're in all the papers. Like I would then get on the tube that morning and go to work. And I'd be like, oh, there I am, there I am behind Kate's elbow uh, looking particularly attractive. So it was a really fascinating, fascinating time in, in the UK media. And 
something that I realized I just would never want to be in her role at all. It was they just yeah. hound you. The scooters would go along in the morning and they yeah, giant crazy. lenses in your face and really no protection of privacy at all. So it was it was a really fascinating excursion. And we broke the world record, the Guinness World Record, by uh, like three hours. We smashed it. So it was a really successful time. It was fun. Excellent. Well, when the paparazzi hound you, you just lift the suitcase and... and <laughs> Well, I'd just like to finish up with a thank you very much for your time and sharing uh, your your knowledge and your expertise. Just a couple of other things um, just before we, we tie it up, but I was just wondering really what's going to be next for you? Where, where are you? I mean, I know you're going to be travelling still, but um, business-wise, um, you know, any, anything on the, on the horizon or just starting to consolidate and continue uh, what you've already been building? It's a great question, actually. I'm consolidating some things and ramping up some others. So for me, um, yeah, just a few more joint ventures in the right area and really having bigger and better launches with more people, being able to scale more and reach a bigger audience. And the, the YouTube video series plus the podcast is something I really want to focus on in terms of getting out there to people and also growing my own brand and um, learning more about those tools and the best way to promote them and building new audience. And for next year, uh, one crazy ass plan that I have half baked in my mind is getting people to choose my next adventure. I don't know if you can re remember those books where it used to be the choose choose my next adventure book. Um, and you'd say if you want John to do this, go to page 43. If you want him to do that, go to 72. And I have this kind of idea whereby I pick the countries but people get to pick the adventure within the country. So that's going to be something that will still play into my business because obviously as I say I preach You've got to have a lifestyle, not just be working your ass off. So that's well, something for yeah. 2013. Do you get to vet? Do you get to vet or pick out of a hat what that adventure would be? I don't know. Actually, I haven't, I haven't <laughs> worked out all the logistics. I've been coming up with it. It could it could go really, really wrong, or it could be super fun. So watch this space. <laughs> I'm, sure you, I'm sure you'll make it fun. It doesn't matter what situation. You'll know how to get uh, make the most out of it. I hope so too. Well, um, yeah. thanks very much. Thanks very much, Natalie, for your time. And it's good that we've been Thank able you. to get the old Google Google Plus happening, the Google Hangouts. Yeah. And uh, you might have to add it to your uh, your uh, productivity tool number eighty six if it's yeah. not already there. <laughs> I'm interested to see eighty six tools. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, um, and and good luck. And we'll keep an keep an eye on things. We'll watch that suitcase as it traverses around the world. <laughs> Thank you so much.